Okay, um, we are continuing with the Sefer Derech Hashem. We are closing off on the third part of the Sefer, and we are now in the last parak, the last chapter of the third part, which is chapter five. After having given a um, an in-depth discussion about prophecy in general, now the Ramchal in this chapter is focusing on Moshe versus the other prophets, and what he said what he said so far. We're now kind of in the middle, the second half of the chapter. We're up to paragraph six, paragraph vav. What he said so far is he's described a couple of traits that are true of all standard prophets, if you will. Um, a couple of traits true to standard prophets. One is that a standard prophet, when he uh, receives a prophecy, he is totally unconscious. He, is, he loses uh, any, any degree of his senses, his regular physical senses, and it's a totally spiritual experience. That's one point. And um, in addition, the, the image comes through while he's either while he's dreaming or um, while he is unconscious in some way, when he's in a deep sleep, that's when, a, that's when a typical prophecy happens. So that's, that's the first um, difference that the Ramchal points out. The other difference that the Ramchal points out is that a standard prophet receives his prophecy in a uh, not so direct. The standard prophet, um, the, the description that Ramchal gives, which is very, very interesting, is that um, standard prophets, it's kind of like a, um, an image that bounces from one mirror to the other and is refracted from one lens to another, to another, to another, many of which are not perfectly clean and clear lenses. So his image, what he's seeing, what the prophet sees, a standard prophet again, is more of a reflection and it's not a perfectly clear reflection on top of that. Um, and the same is true when there is a prophecy in the form of words, a standard prophet receives it as a riddle as opposed to the exact direct words. Those are um, some of the descriptions that the Mechal gives to standard prophets. And then the end of last week's class, we started discussing Moshe Rabbeinu, the difference between and how Moshe Rabbeinu is different. And the first point is, that Moshe Rabbeinu's um, vision was much clearer. Um, the way he describes it is, with a, it's really a, the language of Chazal, the sages in the Talmud itself, a a clear lens, meaning to say that it was a single reflection as opposed to a series of many, many reflections and many lenses. And in addition to that, it was perfectly clear, a perfectly clear lens. He makes the point that Moshe, even Moshe Rabbeinu was not able to look directly at a Kodesh Baruch Hu. So even Moshe Rabbeinu, who was coming in contact with Hashem's glory through prophecy in the highest level of any prophet, he still had to receive it as a reflection through a certain lens and not view it directly. However, it was still much clearer than any other prophet where there was, uh, it was refracting from one lens to another, to another, to another, and it was clouded as well. Um, that is what we covered last week. So now the Ramchal continues. We're now on the bottom, page 242, chapter Vav, which is cha uh, uh, paragraph Vav, excuse me, which is paragraph six. And the Ramchal continues. There's another difference between the other prophets and Moshe. Now on the bottom of 242, 243. You with me, um, Paul? You have that, yeah. please? Perfect. Very interesting point. Your standard Navi, your standard prophet, does not have the power to receive a prophecy at will, whenever he would like. Only at the time that Hashem wants. Then Hashem um, rests his countenance upon that prophet and they receive a prophecy. Ach Moshe Rabbeinu, however, Moshe Rabbeinu, 
Hayadover Tolui Biritso, no. It depended on his will. He had the power to connect to a Kaddish Baruch Hu and to draw down that revelation as it was needed. This is something that uh, we see in a couple of different parshas in the Torah, where a question is raised. Um, the the Mekalil, uh, the person that curses Hashem, they don't know what to do with him, and Moshe Rabbeinu says. Hold on, and I will ask Hashem. And, the Kodesh, and he, he at will, is able to communicate with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. That was a unique um, feature of Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moshe Rabbeinu and only Moshe Rabbeinu were, had the power to um, receive a prophecy by his own will whenever he wanted. Okay, let's continue. The Ode, furthermore, other prophets only were able to grasp specific things. What HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to reveal to them. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to reveal one specific thing to the prophet. He gives that knowledge through a prophecy. That's how every other prophet operates. Ach Moshe Rabbeinu of Shalom Zohar an amazing idea. Moshe Rabbeinu, he merited that everything in all of creation would be revealed to him. And listen to this description. He was given permission to uh, investigate, to delve into everything and to explore everything. Fascinating idea. Moshe Rabbeinu is not limited to what a Kodesh Bar, whatever details a Kodesh Baruch Hu chose to um, transmit to him, like every other prophet. Moshe Rabbeinu was able to enter a state of prophecy, was able to elevate himself to the spiritual realm, and just go exploring, go exploring into the spiritual world and search out whatever information, um, whatever deep secrets of the creation that he wanted, which is really an amazing, amazing idea if you think about it deeply. It was, it was given over to him all of the keys that were never given over to any other mortal. Because of this, what the Pasuk says, fascinating idea. That this is what the Pasuk means when Hashem um, describes Moshe Rabbeinu that in my entire house he is trusted. It's a, a very ambiguous Pasuk if, uh, if you don't have the Ramchal to explain it to you. Hashem says, Moshe Rabbeinu is trusted in my entire house. What does that mean? Moshe Rabbeinu alone was given the keys, was given um, access. That's, that's the real hitting the nail on the head. He was given access to the spiritual world in all of its secrets. Likewise, it says, I placed, I passed all of my goodness. I will, I will pass all of my goodness before your face. So that's another very interesting idea, that very esoteric psukim in the Torah. What does this psukim mean? He's trusted in my entire house. I will pass all of my goodness before your face. What does any of that mean? We read those psokim every single year and we understand, okay, it means some type of revelation, some type of lofty um, spiritual uh, experience. Remchal is giving a definition for us to these psokim in the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is describing that Moshe Rabbeinu was given um, access to the spiritual realm, um, total access, uh, where he's able to explore of his own volition um, any information that he wants to seek out. Okay, Vihine, behold, Hanavim Kulam, all prophets, um, as they grasp that image, as they receive that image that is being formed from them for them from Hashem's honor, as we've mentioned. 
And they grasp the secret of that image. The secret of what can be found in that. Uh, in the way that Hashem's honor, His glory is being formulated. And how it is being transmitted. And what is the intention of all this? And likewise, they grasp um, certain true knowledge, true in, in intellect about the secrets of Hashem's greatness through these images. Fascinating idea. A very, very general statement from the Ramchal about prophecy as a whole. As a prophet comes in through his prophecy, uh, gets a, a comes in contact with Hashem's glory, and gets a a snapshot, if you will, through that image that's revealed to them, that they grasp, and through the way that it's transmitted, they come in contact with Hashem's own glory. They they simultaneously understand in in full truth that Hashem himself has no image. That's a very powerful idea if you think deeply into it. That the prophet, who is the only person to, to, um, to receive Hashem in the form of an image, he's receiving an image coming from the Kodesh Baruch himself, which Ramchal is describing this image as some as some type of form of Hashem's glory, that prophet at the same time understands that it's merely a manifestation, it's merely a, a revelation of Hashem's glory, but it's not an image of Hashem himself. And they the, the prophets grasp to the fullest extent that Hashem himself has no image. And that this image is only something that is being created for, for the eyes of the prophets according to Hashem's will for the reason that is known to him. That's what it is. In regarding this, we have a pasuk in the Torah that says, You'll, you, you did not see an image, you only heard the voice. You will never see an image. You never see an image of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Just other certain iterations, certain emanations, certain revelations of his glory, but never an image of Hashem himself. Two things they grasp simultaneously in their truth. The prophet grasps that uh, the reality of Hashem's existence is with no image whatsoever. He is totally devoid of any of these illustrations, any of these um, illusions. And then after this knowledge, it is revealed to them an image, um, some form of prophetic image. Shalem Emma, that it says, the prophetic image is referred to as they saw the God of Israel. This is what the sages refer to in the Sifri as a mar edibur. A, uh, a power or an image of speech. covered the MS. It's not a true vision of Hashem's glory. But rather an image, a vision that is formed from the power of speech. Just as an image which is formed in a mirror or through a lens, as we mentioned previously. And that through that image, they're able to grasp certain details, certain ideas, 
about the secrets of Hashem, of his godliness, Ubriyaso, and his creation, Vahan Hagaso, his uh, behavior, the way he guides the world, Kumush of as we mentioned. So here the Ramachal is doing something very powerful, and he's doing it in a very kind of subtle way. He's pointing out that if you look in the Torah, you'll find uh, verses that almost contradict each other. We have multiple verses that say that there's no, Hashem has no image. Um, what's the Hashem has no image. Then we have other psukim, they saw the God of Israel. So what is it? Does God have an image? Can he be seen or can he not be seen? So then how is explaining this with uh, this subtlety that Hashem himself, Hashem in his essence has no image at all, whatsoever. However, HaKadosh Baruch Hu nonetheless creates images for the prophets to see. He, he provides them with a vision and that vision is a manifestation, a revelation of understanding, certain understanding of Hashem himself, certain understanding of Hashem's creation, understanding of how Hashem runs this world. All of those deep spiritual knowledge are transmitted to the prophet through an image. So the image is not God himself. They're not viewing God himself, but they're viewing an image created by God, which is God's way of transmitting to them an understanding of these deep secrets, these deep spiritual secrets of the world, these deep secrets of understanding how God operates on deep spiritual understandings of the world, et cetera, et cetera. That is how the Ramchal resolves the semen contradiction, and this is how he concludes the third part of the Sefer Derech Hashem. Um, okay, it is now 8.51, so we do have some more time for tonight's class. So I'd like to begin the fourth part of the Sefer. Um, and the fourth part of the Sefer is really exciting because now the Ramchal takes everything that he's taught us and now it all becomes much more relevant, much more germane. Because until now, the Ramchal has been building up a, a foundation, uh, a, a, a beautiful structure of how to understand the world as we see it, how to understand Kodesh Baruch Hu's creation, how to understand God himself, how to understand the role of mankind, how to understand the spiritual world versus the physical world and the world to come. We've, we've discussed all of that in, this, in our studies of the Sefer Derech Hashem. Now, the fourth part of the Sefer is where all of that becomes part of our day-to-day -day life. And all of, a, all of it becomes extremely relevant. And that is because the fourth part of this book is Ba'avodas Boreinu, service of God. Meaning, now the Ramchal is going to explain to us the mitzvos. He's going to explain to us our purpose in this world, our mission, our job, how we're supposed to spend our, our life serving God, how to understand serving God. And the, the opening chapter is so powerful just in how he breaks things down with such amazing clarity which as we, as we learned when we first started the Sefer, this is really the whole purpose of the Sefer is to take what we already know, take all that information, the, the overwhelming amounts of, of information about of Jewish knowledge of Judaism, Torah, and organize it and break it down into, um, into its, its proper place. So let's begin. Part four, chapter one. Bechil kehavoda, the different parts of service of Hashem. Aleph, number one. Klal the general rule in service of Hashem. Mischalk 
can be divided into two parts. Ha'echad, Talmud. One is study. Ve'hasheni ha'ma'asem. The second is action. So there we have it. Ev, all of Avodah Hashem, everything that we do to serve Hashem can be categorized as one of two categories. Either it's study or it's action. Action can be divided into four parts. This is a very powerful idea. There are four categories of mitzvos. I'm going to use the word mitzvah um, in, um, in, um, um, as a synonym for ma'ase. Four types of mitzvos. Ha'echad t'midi. There are some mitzvos that are constant. 24-7, um, uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 60 minutes an hour, 60 seconds a minute. Constant mitzvos. And we'll see what those mitzvos are in very soon. Hasheni, category number two of mitzvos. Yomi, daily mitzvos. We don't have to do them 24 hours a day, but we have to do them every single day. Hashlishi, category three. Zmani, um, seasonal. That was the uh, dryer. Mitzvahs that apply um, only at certain times of the year. The Harivii, the fourth category, Mikri. Um, mitzvahs that are based on a, an experience or an occurrence, meaning they're not set into the calendar. They're not definite that they're going to happen ever in our lives. But if something occurs, then you then have to do a mitzvah. Um, just so to give basic ideas of this, a constant mitzvah would be something like believing in God. A daily mitzvah would be something like Shema, reciting Shema. You don't have to do it every hour of the day, but you have to do it every single day. Zmani, um, seasonal, a time, a calendar mitzvah, would be something like uh, Korban Pesach. It's once a year, but it's every single year, no matter what. And then Mikri, something that depends on something happening, would be, let's say, for example, um, Ma'ake, building a fence around a flat roof. You have to ha buy a house or build a house with a flat roof to get that mitzvah. It's not something that's certainly not 24 hours a day, not something you have to do every day, not something that's in the calendar. It's not built into the calendar. It's something that if it happens, then you do the mitzvah. Those are the four categories of mitzvahs. Let's continue with the We're up to paragraph three in Gimel. Hatmidi, constant mitzvahs. These are things that a person is obligated in doing constantly. Kigon, examples. Avas Hashem, love of Hashem. V'yiraso, fear of Hashem. Hayomi. Daily mitzvos, mashem uchiyav bo b'kol yom things that he's obligated every day. V'hainu hakarbanos b'zman abayis sacrifices at the time of the beis hamikdash. The achshav and today hatfilos our prayers ukriyashma and reciting of shema. Hazmani a seasonal or time bound meaning uh, according to the calendar. Mashem uchiyav bo b'zman yaduim there are specific times. Kigun shabbosos v'yamim tovim shabbos and yomtiv. A mikri, a um, happenings that they depend on certain things happening. Mashu yichu yivo, v'mashu yigilu min a mikri, a mitzvah according to something happening. Kigon, for example, chala, the mitzvah separating chala. You only have a mitzvah separating chala if you need if you make a dough. If you don't bake any bread and you never make any dough, then you'll never have a mitzvah of chala. Umaaser tithing. That's only if you. Uh, harvest a crap, pigeon a ben, a uh, redeeming the firstborn son. That's only if um, you are not a Kohen, not a Levi, the wife is not from a Kohen family or from a Levi family, and the first child is a boy. That's That knocks out a lot, a lot of people. Pigeon a ben is not so common. Of a Kiyotse, and similarly. Every single one of these examples, what they all have in common is that you will find commands, commandments, and you'll find warnings. 
meaning that would be the, the negative, what we call negative commandments or prohibitions. Dainu asay and Uh The other terminology for that is an asay or a lav, a positive and negative commandment. Vehemem sur me rav aseito. That is the concept of to stay away from evil and to go do what is good. Okay, let's continue now with, with paragraph four, Dawud v'amnam. However, ikur kol hanyonim ha'elah b'derf klau, the primary of all of this, in its general sense, nisbo'er b'chilik rishon, perak v. We've already explained it all the way back in the first part of this book, the fourth chapter, shehu ha'pniya levyaz baruch u v'akashas kirvaso, it, all of these mitzvahs are ways of turning towards Hashem and requesting a closeness to Hashem. According to the ways that Hashem has established uh, in order to come close and to cling to Him. We need to, to make our effort to remove all of those obstacles of evil that uh, cling to us, those the darkness of the physicality of this world. To, to strengthen ourselves in uh, clinging to Hashem, uh, sorry, coming close to Hashem and clinging to Him, and become perfecting ourselves, completing ourselves. This is, exact, this is all that Hashem wants from us. This is the whole purpose of creation, as we've mentioned all the way in the beginning of this book. However, the details, the specifics of these matters, according to um, Excuse me. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the details, the specifics, are according to the nature of man and the world with all of their different facets. And the ways for man to perfect himself and complete himself. And likewise, to complete and to perfect in all of creation. According to its orders and all of its divisions, its roots and its branches. We will now go on to explain a few of them that are, that are the most relevant and the most common in all places and at all times. So that is the introduction. So the Ramchal is telling us that this really, this entire part of this of this work, uh, the the part four, which is Avodas Habore, service of Hashem, really brings us back to the beginning, because the beginning of the Sefer, the Ramchal told us, the purpose of the entire creation was for to to create man, to be able to offer, to be able to do good for man, because. Why does God need, need anything? He doesn't need anything. No. God needs to be able to do good. To be able to do good, not, God needs a recipient. And who is the recipient of, God, of God's goodness? Man. And what is the... But for us to receive... For us to receive goodness from God, we need to earn it. Because that is the only way for the goodness... For Hashem's goodness to be complete. Because if he gifts it to us, if it's given as a gift and not earned, it's not the same. It's not on the same level. It's not similar to Hashem himself. That is what Havot Ramchal described in the beginning of the Sefer. And what is the practical way in which we achieve this, in which we perfect ourselves, we cling to Hashem, and we earn that goodness that is none other than the mitzvahs. That is the idea. And, and as we continue, the Ramchal is going to get into the details of how each of these mitzvos accomplishes that ultimate goal. Um, 
but of all those mitzvos, they can be divided into study and action. And action can be divided into four types, constant, daily, um, special times, and um, based on actions or based on specific occurrences. Those are the four categories of mitzvahs. And um, in Yitz Hashem next week, we'll continue with chapter two, where we're going to start exploring mitzvah by mitzvah, how to understand them and get a new, deeper uh, understanding of each of these mitzvahs, which we're doing regularly in Yitz Hashem uh, from the Mechal's perspective. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. I want to wish you a wonderful night.